Good morning to everybody. I will uh, say everything again. I hope now I can be heard. My name is Maria Kiriago Solomonido, and I'll, I will be monitoring um, this morning's events. On behalf of uh, ESLA and uh, the Speech and Language um, Therapy Day and SLT Awareness Task Force, let me welcome you and uh, wish everybody happy European Speech and Language Therapy Day. This is our celebration. Today's webinar um, is the first of the four webinars of 2022, and it's part of ESLA's webinar, professional, uh, webinar senior series for professional development. <laughs> In March, the topic of the webinar is also follows the theme of the year. And as you all already know, the theme for this year is speech and language therapy across the lifespan. Uh, some logistics, you have all been muted for a smoother um, transition. Please write your comments and your questions in chat. The link for the evaluation will be uh, added in the chat as we go along. Please fill out the evaluation form. It's important for us to know what um, uh, your feedback. Also, let me tell you that the event is being um, live streaming. It's been being live streaming on Facebook, and please invite people that didn't have a chance to register to follow the presentation on uh, on Facebook. And uh, without further ado, because we would like to keep the time as we promised, I would like to invite ESLA's chair, Norma Camilleri, to say a few words. Norma. Thank you, Maria, for the introduction. And good morning, everyone, dear ESLA members, colleagues, friends, Dear European speech language therapists, it's been a year since we rebranded our organization to ESLA. A year that's been quite eventful, a year that was full of advocacy work, activities within our different task forces, preparations for our upcoming Congress, conversations with colleagues from our profession, as well as other professions with whom we work and collaborate and a lot of listening. Yes, we listened to what our members needed, what support they required to help improve the status of our profession in their respective countries, to be able to improve the service delivery to clients for whom we work. And more recently, we tried to give the support we can, or at least be close in our thoughts with our youngest member association, the Ukrainian Society of Speech Language Therapists. As a European family of speech and language therapists, we stand united as we witness in total horror the inhumane events resulting from the war in Ukraine. Thousands of individuals are forced to leave the safety and comfort of their homes and flee to other countries in an attempt to seek shelter. These are not images we should be seeing in this day and age. And many are also being deprived of their human right for much needed therapy, for communication and swallowing service. And we reiterate that ESLA, as the leading organization representing SLTs in Europe, is ready to offer expert support to humanitarian organizations hosting displaced individuals as requested. Thank you, Oksana Lialka, Chair of the Ukrainian, Ukrainian Society of SLTs, for being with us this morning in spite of the difficult times you are going through. I pray that this nightmare comes to an end soon. So on 6th March, we celebrate the European Speech Language Therapy Day a date which marks the birthday of our organization. ESLA will be in fact 34 years tomorrow. During this past year, we had various task forces in action, namely communication strategy, additional revenue, SLT Day and SLT Awareness who organized this webinar this morning, Congress and SLT material. 
Some have concluded their work, which will be presented at our upcoming Congress. And we also have recently set up three new task forces, which will focus on professional and educational standards, the status of the profession in Europe and awareness materials. These task forces are open to our members at large, so they are open to all members within our member organizations. And here I take the opportunity to thank the more than 30 members we have in all the task forces. We are indebted for the expertise you very humbly offer to these groups. And I also thank the social media team who ensure that Tesla is constantly present on the social media platforms. It is truly a wonderful example of collaborative practice, which brings together different cultures different work practices, and I must say very good coordination of logistics for meetings, especially when there are some three different time zones. So thank you all for your hard work. At ESLA, we continued striving to communicate and create collaborations with other organizations. And I am pleased to announce that we have formed a working group together with IALP the International Association of Communication Sciences and Disorders, which group will be working on promoting speech and language therapy as career pathway. We have also had conversations with COTEC, the Council for Occupational Therapists in European countries, which you will hear more about later. Advocacy for our clients, promotion and safeguarding of our profession, of course, remain top priorities on ESLA's agenda. The aim of the European SLT Day is to raise awareness of communication and swallowing disorders and the role of speech and language therapists. The theme for this year is speech and language therapy across the lifespan. We have already seen some countries celebrating this day through different activities, such as Romania and the UK did earlier this week. I am aware that Turkey also will be having an event this evening, and many other countries will be following suit in the coming days through the organization of workshops, training sessions, and conferences to publicize how speech and language therapy is vital for all age groups. And in fact, through this year's theme, we want to highlight that speech and language therapy can be indeed effective throughout the lifespan. Communication and swallowing difficulties have no age barrier. And likewise, our profession cannot have any age barrier. We want anyone with a communication or swallowing disorder to be aware that they can seek help from a speech language therapist at any age. And this theme will also be emphasized at our upcoming 11th Congress to be held in Salzburg, Austria, between the 26th and 28th of May. This Congress will showcase new frontiers in speech and language therapy from all aspects of practice, research and education. And I take the opportunity to remind you that registration is open and at the moment you can still benefit from the early bird rate. We have a very varied program and hope you will be able to join us either on site in Salzburg or online. And I thank the Congress Task Force for whom it was no easy feat to organize such an event amidst the instability that the pandemic has brought. On this year's celebration of the European Day of SLT, we want to stress the role that an SLT can play in an individual's quality of life at any point in time. We want to ensure that individuals do not miss out on the opportunity to receive help simply because they think we cannot help them at their age. Today, we are very honored that Dr. Hazel Rodham has accepted our invitation to present for us as you know, apart from being an SLT with huge reputation, as most of you know, Hazel was also ESLA's very first administrator. Thank you, Hazel, for being with us today. Before I conclude, I wish to give my heartfelt thanks to the SLT Day and SLT Awareness Task Force 
who worked relentlessly for today's webinar, and to our young, enthusiastic administration team, and last but not least, <coughs> my fantastic fellow members, board members, Fofi, Eliana, Blazenkang, Yentang, and Pino. And to you all, let us continue working together for the benefit of all individuals with communication and swallowing disorders. Let us continue raising awareness that speech language therapy is indeed beneficial across the lifespan. Thank you all for being with us. Thank you, Norma, for your comments. Uh, we continue now to the main event of today's, uh, today's programme. Uh, and here our presentation, speech and language therapy across the lifespan, the value and impact of a scientific profession. It is my privilege and honor to present Dr. Rodan, who has established a reputation as an international influencer for build, building research capacity and promoting strategies to embed evidence-based practice across <clears throat> all allied health disciplines, having delivered over 30 international invited keynote addresses and lectures in 20 countries on the topic. Wow. He's currently working for Health Education <laughs> England <clears throat> to lead the implementation of their national strategy for research and innovation across 14 allied health professions. In addition, Hazel has been deeply committed to the work of ESLA formerly CEPLOL since 2008. Hazel, thank you for accepting and we are eager to hear your presentation. Thank you, thank you for the invitation. And thank you for the, this very warm introduction. I am thrilled to be here with you all today. I'm so delighted to recognize many faces, many names. So uh, without further ado, I, I will explain what I have prepared to talk to you about today. Now then let's just hope that the um, technology works well. Okay. So the, the title, the, the lifespan, speech and language therapy across the lifespan, this gave me a lot of thoughts. I reflected about what I could talk to you about today. We all recognize that we, through our service, we work with people across the age span. We say from the cradle to the grave, from uh, newborn babies to end of life care, for many, many different uh, needs for communication support and for eating, drinking, swallowing support. So I will talk a little bit about the population need across the lifespan, but I've also been reflecting about the profession, the lifespan of our profession, our history, where we've come from, where we have reached now, and where we can go in the future. So I'm also going to take the um, indulgence of reflecting on my own career. This year is 45 years since I started my training. And so I feel I have seen many changes already, and I'm going to make some comments about that too. But in particular, my challenge to all of you listening today is about the future, how we can safeguard and protect and ensure the quality, the value and the impact of our services in the future for those people and their families who need our services and for ourselves as professionals who deliver those services. So that's what I shall focus on mostly today. I have packed in a lot into this short presentation. Knowing that this will be recorded, I am going to go fairly quickly over some um, of parts of the presentation, knowing that the, the links are there, the references to published work and published sources, that for those of you who wish, you can revisit again afterwards to find more information. Okay, so as we have already heard in Norma's introduction, the European Day of Speech and Language Therapy is our campaign in ESLA to raise awareness of the general public about our professional services, the impact of communication and swallowing disorders on people's lives. The public have very limited awareness of our jobs. You all know this 
feeling when you introduce yourself and you say the what you do for your job you're met with a lot of surprise the public have an awareness of motor speech work articulation work they have awareness probably of our work in fluency thinking about the the film the king's speech from more than 10 years ago had a, a massive impact on public awareness but again just limited to one small part of the sort of work that we do the film a few years later about the life of uh, Professor Stephen Hawking, who was a professor at Cambridge um, of uh, astrophysics, who himself had to rely on communication aid technology. Again, that raised a spotlight in the public eye about the role of speech and language therapy. So this helps our campaign to raise awareness, but it's only limited. To, to certain aspects. I want to recommend to all of you that you might take a note of this YouTube video, completely public free video. It is only five minutes long, but it is so powerful. This campaign was led by Sir uh, Michael Palin, who is a well-known uh, actor in, in UK, but he is also the director of the uh, Centre for Stammering in London. And together with the campaign group in UK, they released this video, which is voiced by many, many people, more than 50 voices that explain in their own words from their own lives what speech and language therapy does and what it does not do. It is very powerful for conveying the message about our profession. I highly recommend it. It's also very amusing, very easy to watch. You will want to recommend this to everybody that you know. So I offer you that if you weren't already aware of it. Reflecting about our history very, very briefly where we've come from, we are a young profession. Just over 100 years ago, since uh, the origins of speech and language therapy, as we now call it, came from um, speech and drama and the performing arts, there was a lot of focus uh, in the early days on the uh, articulation, clear speaking, public speaking. And that was across Europe, we're pleased to say, and that led to the institution of many formal professional associations. And this is my awareness. I'm very open to being corrected, but I believe that the earliest speech and language therapy professional association in Europe was in Denmark, followed by others. This is just a tiny selection of some of our associations. And at the bottom of the slide, you will all be aware, you can look at the ESLA homepage to find out the current members, including our very recent uh, new uh, member associations, as Norma referred to. We are delighted that Oksana is here with us today. And of course, a very, very a uh, huge privilege for me to be presenting today on ESLA's first anniversary weekend. I'm not going to take very long on this, but I just wanted to show you that, yes, it is 45 years since I started in this career and what an amazing career it has been. I had no sense as a, a teenager of what my future career would hold. So much variety and so much satisfaction in being able to work with many families, I'll tell you a little bit about that, but also to work at a professional level, nationally and internationally. And to have that recognized, that has been wonderful. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more, as Norma said, about my current work too. And very proud to have had this very long standing involvement with my European family of speech and language therapy community. One of the biggest changes I have seen in 45 years has been the use of technology. That has transformed my work in clinical life. Technology existed. So this first photograph, the black and white, is from uh, the uh, School of Audiology at the University of Manchester when I first started my training. Technology was exciting, but very limited in its application. And as we've all seen over the last few years in particular, we have been catapulted forward in the technology, the tools that we have available to use, very sophisticated now, very powerful, and in the way that in the last couple of years we've been using more tele-rehabilitation, 
and more uh, distance um, interventions. That's been fabulous. That has shown all of us the power of technology. But it's not only the power of technology for us as professionals, but the families we work with have access to technology. In the last decade, we've seen something that we never saw before. Families are coming to us to seek our help, but they are saying to us, we've looked on Google. We know what our problem is. We know what therapy we want. And we need to be prepared, prepared as professionals to engage in those conversations about the latest research evidence, what is known publicly, and how that relates and is valuable to the context and the family we are working with. So we need to engage in conversations with people who are very, very well informed. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about my work. I started um, voluntary work even before I began my professional training with very young children who had profound and multiple disabilities, sensory impairments, physical disabilities, cognitive uh, disabilities. I was delighted all my career, but right from the very beginning to work in, in powerful partnerships with colleagues in occupational therapy, and they are joining us uh, today, and you'll hear more about that later, and with physiotherapy, but with many, many other health professions and medical and nursing colleagues too. My work was with children who had needs for communication support, motor speech work, but also eating, drinking, swallowing. Uh, but it was in the area of uh, communication and the voice output technology that I found the, the digital revolution, the technology that was available was so powerful from when I first trained and we had to rely on hand-drawn pictures and photographs to enable uh, non-verbal individuals to be able to communicate. And then with the advent of voice output technology, that transformed the way that we could work. People could become much more independent and they could have a voice of their own. I was deeply honoured back in the early 1990s to win a large grant from the UK government to introduce this voice output technology into the schools where I was working. And I was asked to present that work at, um, at Westminster alongside Professor Stephen Hawking, who also addressed the audience using his voice output communication aid and advocated for the human right to access communication channels, not only the human right to speech, but to be able to speak. I've continued that theme in some of my research work of looking at how we can use technology. So voice output technology, and here I, I show you uh, um, a well-known comedian in UK, who was uh, a recent graduate from my university in Preston. And we are very proud that again, he's influencing public awareness of uh, how people can communicate when they have no voice. So he is nonverbal, but he uses voice output technology. Also, just a couple of years ago, 2019, uh, I was very pleased to work on a publication that I'm showing you here, which was published um, about the involvement of the patients, the service users and their families in the development of technologies and how we use those technologies. In that case, it was for the development of apps for use on mobile phones for people with aphasia. But that was just one example. So I moved from my clinical career 15 years ago into an academic role. But I want to show you that even in UK where we 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 love to wear our academic robes on ceremonial occasions. We are ordinary people. We are no different from clinicians. Researchers ask a lot of questions. We are driven by trying to find answers to demonstrate in a robust and scientific way the answer to those questions. But we are ordinary people. We don't look different. You all, as expert, experienced clinical practitioners, you have the same scientific thinking. You have the same questioning mind. We need to work together in partnership more than ever before between people who have the depth of clinical experience and the depth of academic experience so that we can answer these questions and improve our services for everyone that needs them. So in 2019, I was deeply honored to be given this fellowship award by the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists um, for my, my 
contribution to the professional work, but particularly for my work, not only in science, but in communicating science and encouraging people to use research in their own practice. A quick word to thank my dear colleague who's on the call today, Dr. Mark Jays, for nominating me for that award. Thank you, Mark. So when I was chair of the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists back in 2010, this was a major campaign that we launched. Very similar to ESLA's European Day campaign, our aims were to raise public awareness and to act as advocates for the need for better communication and swallowing services for people that needed them. We were given support from people whose faces were very familiar in UK, people from the celebrity public entertainment world, but also very heavyweight politicians. That support was very much needed. This campaign is continuing to, to, up until today. It's still a very strong campaign. We were given support in that campaign to teach us how we can have more impact, more strength and power for our, our lobbying, for public awareness, for political influencing. And these are the messages that I've spoken about before in CIPLO and now ESLA, but I want to, to share with you today simple four steps to attracting attention and influencing. We need to demonstrate the evidence for our services. But first of all, we need to get people to listen to us. Step number one, we need to talk about the human impact. If someone has a communication or a swallowing disorder, if they've had a stroke, if they are a young child with developmental disabilities or autism, what does it feel like to be that person struggling to communicate, to socialize, to have um, equality of access in, 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 the, in society? But when you're talking to people, not only the general public, but particularly policy makers and politicians, they will be influenced by hearing about a, a personal story, but they will say, what's the scale of the problem? How many people? So we need to have that data at our fingertips, the population data to be able to say, so many, 100,000 people. This isn't just one case or a few. This is a huge proportion of our population this is the power that we have to be able to influence and get action. Message number three, we need to say, okay, so what can we do about it? What is the contribution from our profession? But it's not enough to be worthy or well-meaning or to say um, a, a belief-based claim, we know that we can make a difference, that's not sufficient. We need scientific robust evidence to be able to say our interventions our case management as part of wider services in health, uh, education, social care, it's our contribution that makes a difference and we need to be able to have the tools to measure that and show that. And message number four, we need to finish with a strong challenge to say, and what is the risk if you do not uh, support our services, if we cannot provide these services? For example, with young children with developmental disorders, if they do not get timely access to the communication support that they need from our profession, they risk poor educational attainment, they risk lower employability, they risk entry into the criminal justice system, and they are at high, high risk of severe mental health uh, and even psychiatric problems. This is the messaging that we need to be conveying, very strong, very powerful, very scientific. We also need to be able to demonstrate that our services that we offer are accessible to the public who need them and acceptable. So this is where we need to bridge from uh, pure research, which may demonstrate the effectiveness, uh, the efficacy of speech and language therapy services in a research context. We need to demonstrate that these services are also accessible and acceptable to people to be able to cope with the types of work we are asking them to do, to practice independently and to access our services. But not everyone can access our services. We need to be aware and we need to talk to uh, policy makers, to commissioners of services and to politicians about 
equality of access. So we need to talk in terms of inequality in health outcomes, health and well-being, but also inequality of access to services. This is the language I'm encouraging us all to use. Now, I'm going to move to the present day. This is the work that I have been doing on behalf of edu Health Education England. So this started in January 21 last year when I was invited to write a, a health professions research and innovation strategy for England. And I'm going to tell you just a little bit more about that. But this is the role for Health Education England within the wider NHS national organization. Um, Health Education England are looking at promoting new roles, new ways of working for the current workforce and the future workforce. In UK, and specifically in England, we recognise many different healthcare professions. Speech and language therapy is uh, one of the top three in terms of size. But I'm going to show you uh, just a little glimpse of who we are working with. These are the professional bodies and associations that I've been working with that cover these 14 associations. They include the very smallest associations in England, which um, include the drama therapists, art therapists, music therapists, who collectively have a huge profile for their scientific research work in the field of mental health and psychiatry. But all our professions all together, all have very powerful research um, achievements and impact, but individually each association is very small. We need the collective voice to be able to have impact and visibility. So this is the strategy. It was launched at the end of January this year, um, and I was very proud to be able to do that public launch. Uh, it's available, the full strategy is fully publicly available, including uh, a webinar that was recorded of that broadcast. It didn't come out of thin air. Since 2013, health, um, um, the NHS, National Health Service in England, has been pushing this agenda for research and innovation. The dialogue has been about research should be everybody's business. Not everybody should be a researcher, but we should all be keeping ourselves updated and informed and using the best research to inform our practice. But we have seen that this has not happened. This is a mantra, a rhetoric that people talk about, but it doesn't really change practice yet. We are still working very hard to push for that. So continuing the push uh, in 2017, on behalf of the Allied Health Professions across England, there was a strategy that incorporated evidence-based practice and use of research. It covered other professional issues as well. That is currently being refreshed and the updated version of that strategy will be published later this year. But last year, again, the National Health Service and the Department of Health and Social Care, they're the ones with the money in UK, um, they again are pushing this message that we need to ensure that all our workforce are equipped and um, confident to be able to do this, to be able to push the research agenda, That's generating research, contributing to research and putting research into practice. So this is the context in which we publish our Allied Health Professions Research and Innovation Strategy. I want to quickly show you this paper because this is a really important paper. This was published in 2015, and this demonstrates the strength of evidence that where health professionals are engaged in the research evidence for their own field of practice, it will have impact, it will make a difference. It's a very large paper, you don't need to read all of it. Here are the headlines, okay? So these findings are really important. They show us that it will improve clinical outcomes. There are many other influences on clinical outcomes though. But messages two and three, that where we are dedicated to supporting the use of research in practice, to supporting healthcare professionals 
to be research engaged and research confident, to talk about research, to have research underpinning their practice, it will improve processes of care and it will improve the patient's experience of care. So that was 2015, what are we doing now? I'm delighted to say that together with a group of researchers, I am involved this year in publishing an update to that very big review. The first review covered all healthcare professionals. We are looking explicitly at allied health, including speech and language. That will be published later this year, but we hope very soon the protocol will be published in full. Okay, quickly to tell you a little bit about the strategy. I can't tell you everything, but I do want to make a few points. That this strategy applies to everyone at whatever career stage. It isn't the fact that you have to wait until you've been practicing for so long before you can start to be more involved in the research agenda. It's for everyone from students, support workers, everyone at all career stages and all different types of jobs. And it's critical. If we don't do this now, our research agenda will just continue at a snail's pace. We need to accelerate. We need to get um, sustainable uh, in in investment and support for this agenda. And we need to have a definitive statement. Before I was invited to write this strategy, strategy we didn't have one. All the individual professional associations have their own strategies for research, but we didn't have a collective reference statement, and now we do. What we mean by research and innovation, we're talking about what makes a difference to the quality of the services we deliver. It's about improving services. That's the bottom line, that's why we're doing it. It's not about people's careers. We need research leaders for the future, and we need them to be able to grow their uh, research environment and to take a lot of people along with them who again will sustain the legacy of the research leadership into the future for our profession. But this isn't about people's careers, it's about improving quality of service for people that need it. And we need to be able to measure that we're doing that. So we need to be able to measure the capacity. That means the whole wider workforce are engaged with this, not just a few. But for the few, we do need to support their research career development. There needs to be access to training, access to network um, and collaborative um, research partnerships. But nobody works in a vacuum. It doesn't matter how skilled you are, how passionate you are. We can only work within systems and processes, so we need to influence the context and we need to influence our mindset, our expectations of our professional identity. Again, research, innovation, service improvement is not the bolt-on luxury if we have time or energy. It should underpin everything that we do. Our patients, our families, our services and our colleagues will only benefit if we're all committed to this quality improvement. So we've got three strategic vision statements. You can see these in full. Each one, each vision, vision statement is underpinned by strategic aim and a number of strategic objectives. So number one, just to show you, we need to transform allied health, professional identities, cultures and roles. Statement two, Delivery of excellence, that's what we're aiming for. We'll achieve that by having world leading research, but research alone won't make a difference unless it is supported to be implemented into practice. And we need to have a voice at the national strategic level for our research agendas and our research priorities. Okay, I said, we're not just talking about careers, and we're definitely not talking about a brain drain. We don't want to take expert clinical practitioners and move them into universities. That's not what it's about. It's about pe keeping people in clinical services, leading clinical services, but giving them skills in academic and scientific skills too. So I'm just going to leave you with these 
very few selection of papers, and you can find many more on the Health Education England website, which I've given links to already. This demonstrates that where we can keep people in clinical services, but with research skills and research connections and networks, then we will be able to improve quality of services and impact it on quality of care. And how can we measure that impact of, on quality and value of care? This was a, an excellent paper that, that defined these six domains. This is where we can make a difference. There will be health benefits to the people and the families we're working with. We will be able to change workforce and the ways that we work. We will increase our legacy for the future of our research profile leadership and our capacity to keep going. But there will be economic benefits as well. This is the language that we need to speak about when we're speaking with uh, politicians, influencers and commissioners of services. There will be influence as well and impact and changes on our professional associations and on our professional education. We have seen big changes in our curriculum teaching to embed uh, evidence-based practice, to embed awareness and skills and confidence in our students in terms of research design. I didn't have that when I trained. We didn't know the R word, the research word. Knowledge production and knowledge exchange. As I've said, we don't want libraries full of the electronic equivalent of lots and lots of publications. We're already drowning in publications. We need work that is actually going to get that research into practice. Knowledge exchange. I recommend this to you. This is uh, something that we're talking a lot about in UK at the moment. This tool to measure the impact of these changes in real world services. So this is a, a very flexible tool and a very valuable tool that allows you to uh, describe the context of where you're working and measure the impact of changes that you are making. What's happening next in UK with the strategy that I launched last month? We're going to have a one year on reflection event in January 23, but coming up very, very soon, we've got a series of three webinars which will be interactive. I've coined the phrase, continuing the conversation. We need to keep people talking about this. We need to maintain the visibility to get the impact of this conversation. So these are all open, these are free, you are all welcome to join in and they're all recorded and will be uploaded afterwards for people to share and to watch again. So here are the dates, the very first one is going to be just in a couple of weeks time where we will start to talk about our vision statement one. These are lunchtime broadcasts meant to be uh, accessible to people while they eat their lunch, that's fine, munch their sandwiches and listen in and submit comments, submit questions. And all those comments and questions will be saved and will be um, noted by us. This is really going to inform what will be a five year, 10 year programme of moving forward to address the barriers that people are facing and to celebrate the enablers and share good practice. We are also delighted that the major research funder in England, the National Institute for Health Research, is going to work with us in the summer this year. We are hosting an Allied Health Professions Research Summit to bring together all the major stakeholders to help to develop um, more strategies and a more strategic approach to this legacy that we want to generate for research and innovation, service improvement, quality improvement for all our services. One last thing I want to mention to you, and completely free, is an online expo of research and innovation across nursing midwifery and allied health. That's starting again in two weeks time. You can register and you can visit for the period of a whole month, a virtual gallery of exhibitions of impact of research and innovation service evaluation across our health professions. There are also going to be 12 invited lectures during that month. The lectures will be lunchtime 
early evening, Saturday mornings like this one. Highly recommend, this is a very creative group in the northwest of England who are hosting that expo. So I've come to the end now. I've got personal challenges for all of you and then a personal challenge for Esla. My personal challenge for all of you today, individual practitioners in whatever job role you may be in whatever career stage and for the professional associations across Europe. What I've talked about today is a message for all of us. We need to demonstrate that we are scientific professionals, that we are committed to evidence-based practice and values-based practice. That means we get the balance between using the published research evidence, but with the values, the choices, the preferences of the people, the families we're working with. It is patient first, family first services that we're looking for. But what we need to be smart about is understanding and learning the terminology, the methodology of implementation science. This is the latest buzzword, but it's not new. 10 years we've been hearing this word, but it's now coming to the fore. It's coming more and more into our awareness. I was invited to publish a commentary about that uh, last year, which was in the Australian journal. Unfortunately, that's not open access, but you can find lots more information about that um, by following up. Do keep your ears open and join the conversation about implementation science. So ESLA has wonderful networks, the, the strategic uh, positioning across all our professional associations on, uh, across Europe. Norma announced at the beginning of this webinar the new task force that has been launched to gather comparative data that we need across Europe to tell us, we, we get in, in ESLA constant inquiries about population need and where people can access specialist services, especially from one country to another. We need to know where is our expertise, but we need to be sharing that expertise, reciprocal knowledge exchange. And ESLA supporting more collaborative research and innovation. Norma mentioned that it's only now a few months before the ESLA's 11th scientific congress that will be held in May this year. That's a, an amazing opportunity for everyone to take part, to listen in online if you can't travel in person, but to take advantage of making sure that you are up to date with the best practice and research knowledge that we are sharing worldwide. We have worldwide presenters, I'm sure, but what a wonderful family and opportunity to remind ourselves that we belong to this professional community across Europe. So with my huge thanks for having been invited to talk to you today, I would like to end my presentation. Uh, I welcome uh, any questions that you may have. I'll stop sharing my screen and look forward to seeing many of you very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rodan, for all this wonderful information and the challenges that you put uh, upon us and on our clinical uh, and uh, academic uh, um, positions that we, that we hold. We would like to give some time for uh, questions. I would like uh, Rafaela Citro to take over for the question and answer session. I would, would like to give 10 minutes for questions and answers. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Edsel. A very inspiring uh, presentation. Until now, we have no uh, no questions. We have had the interest for uh, the Allied Health um, website. Um, the, the website address was um, was requested, and and we had uh, a reply for it, and also the, um, a request for uh, the YouTube uh, channel when where you uh, post your um, experiences. Um, uh, waiting for other questions. Uh, I would like to ask you um, about the um, scope of um, your strategy. 
if you could clarify what is the difference between capacity and capability um you know we are, we are not um, um, uh, mother language speakers and so uh, maybe this could uh, could help us understand more thank you ed thank you i'm very happy that you asked that question Raffaella, because um it is important. When I was invited to write this strategy, I was asked to write uh, a strategy for building research capacity. So I understood that that meant that they wanted to increase the number, the volume of people who had skills and confidence in research. If I said to them, is this what you really mean? Research capacity in the wider workforce means that we want everyone to as I have been talking about this morning, understand and be able to feel confident to talk about research uh, for your own area of work. But we don't want everyone to be researchers. We need clinicians, we need expert practitioners, but we need practitioners who are using research evidence to make sure that they keep improving the quality of the service they provide. Capability building, means developing skills in individuals right up the career ladder to become um, dedicated uh, researchers. So that is the difference. Capacity is in the wider workforce. That's, that's skilling up everybody to have um, awareness, confidence to use research. C capability is about skills of individuals to undertake research. I hope that that helps. When I said to uh, Health Education England, what I think you really need is both capacity and capability building. They said, oh, yes, we're glad that you clarified that. But then I, I went on, as I've said this morning, to say, actually, you also need four C's. You need context and culture as well. Context we can measure. That's about systems and processes. Are those systems and processes supporting us to use research in practice? Are those systems and processes helping us to develop research careers? Culture is slightly different. That's much more difficult to measure. Culture mm. is ephemeral. It's about people's expectation and their professional identity. When people like myself as a teenager thought, oh, well, I, I'd like to do this as a profession, they have a certain expectation of what that will be. And there's a lot of focus very naturally on the clinical practice, on doing the job without understanding the scientific underpinning and scientific thinking that goes underneath that. So we need to challenge this thinking when people say, oh, I'm not interested in research. I just want to do my job. You mm -hmm. can't do your job well unless you are well-informed and up to date and uh, that you are, as I call it, research aware. But research is, a, is a, a difficult word. It makes people think about laboratories and very traditional scientific research. We're talking about applied research. Questions that will uh, make a difference to the way that we work. So it's about questions for public health. It's about questions of uh, service delivery. It's about questions of applying uh, research interventions in real world. Thank you. Thank you, Hazel. It's very clear. And uh, with these words, um, you in part answered also the question from Mark Jace uh, that asked you, how can we ensure adequate training in research skills for SRPs and the opportunities for them to use these skills in practice? Thank you, uh, Mark, for that question. In England, we are working with something which is called the Council of Deans for Health. So every university in England that has um, a programme for uh, medicine, for nursing, for midwifery, for um, allied health, as I've introduced our 14 allied health professions. Um, in the university sector, there is a dean and an executive dean who, who governs uh, and is responsible for the curriculum. So we are working with these deans to uh, ensure more commitment uh, for research experience for students. 
so that they are exposed to the research environment when they are still students and they have a positive experience that they have an expectation that research will be part of their working life but they will also realize that it's possible for them to have a research career so we are trying to work with the students so the pre-registration cohorts who will be our generations of the profession for the future as well as working with uh, people influence like the national institute for health research who give the the majority of funding for research training for people who are already qualified and experienced practitioners thank you hazel mm I ask you also a um, question from um, our board members, uh, Fofi Constantinidou, um, who asked you, uh, in your experience, uh, what are the um, biggest barriers uh, in, uses, in using research in practice? I, I could list many. And we have, uh, since the early 1990s, we have seen the publication of very many um, academic papers, which are called all grouped together barriers papers. So Fofi, you have put your finger on something that people have been concerned about for a long time. And these barriers are all the same, they don't change. The barriers for the workforce to be able to implement research in practice, number one is always time. And number two, confidence. And number three, access to research. So for students in a university context, you have access to the university library. You have access to um, lecturers, researchers, if we hope. So you have access to sources of research. When you are working in clinical practice and not affiliated with the university, you are the same as the general public. You can go on Google, you can find published abstracts, just the short summary statement of publications, but you can't necessarily access the full publication to understand what did this research paper say? Should I change my practice? Because I don't know enough information about who were they working with in this study and what exactly did they do? You need to read the full paper about what did they do and how did they measure before you decide to change your practice. So this question of open access papers has been a big concern for a long time. In the next 10 years, I'm delighted to say we will see open access uh, for more and more publications. And that is what has been one of the very biggest barriers for, for many decades up till now. Confidence, just reading publications is one thing, but people need to feel confident and you can't do that on your own. You need to talk to each other. So journal clubs, we run an online journal clubs completely free. Um, it, ResNet, Research Support Network. There are many other similar networks. ESLA supports the SLPHD network, which also talks about research and puts people in contact with each other to gain those skills of confidence in talking. And just a few years ago, there was a German language um, journal club. Again, it, it's free, it's online. People can join in. There are a number of other language journal clubs uh, across mainland Europe as well, different European languages, I meant to say. Have a look to see, contact ESLA, ask about different networks. <clears throat> Yes, um, yes, we um, we shared the address of um, of Esla, the different addresses, so people who want to um, ask um, other questions could uh, um, could um, uh, ask there because we have to close our session now. Um, um, there is also the, the address of the ResNet uh, Journal Club, Twitter Club, on, uh, on the chat that you can, can use and, um, and visit. Um, please share any other questions um, in the email address of uh, ESLA. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ezel. Maria. Thank you, Raffaella. Uh, the challenges of the clinical work and 
trying to maintain your clinical skills with the evidence to support your clinical decisions is always being uh, a challenge to me personally as well. So thank you very much for giving us all this information. Thank you, um, Rafaela, for uh, giving us the questions. Before we finish for the day, I would like to give the floor to Fofi Costandinudi, uh, Costandinudo, our deputy chair, to give us some um, interesting information on ESLAS, one of ESLAS um, uh, target, which is collaboration as mentioned by uh, our chair earlier. So Fofi, please. Thank you, Maria. Good morning, everyone from uh, sunny Nicosia, and thank you for joining and especially to our uh, colleagues from the Ukraine. So the European SLT Day is a significant activity towards our mission. And as you know, SLS mission is to increase the visibility and awareness of speech and language therapy in Europe and beyond by actively promoting the profession and safeguarding professional and educational standards. So the ESLA board and task forces have been working systematically to meet our organization's mission, vision, and objectives. In addition to the SLT day, the webinar series, and the Congress, the ESLA board has been dedicating time in building strategic partnerships with other like-minded organizations, such as IOP, as well as organizations representing other health professions. We have recently begun discussions with our colleagues at CODEC, the Council of Occupational Therapists for the European countries. Uh, CODEC has a similar history to ESLA. It was established in 1986 with the purpose of coordinating the views of the National Associations of Occupational Therapy in Europe. And it is the European organization for all occupational therapy associations. Uh, and there are about 33 associations right now, members of CODEC. Both CODEC and ESLA members understand the value of interprofessional collaboration for the benefit of our clients. We are currently exploring mutually beneficial ways for our two organizations to collaborate. As a, general, as a gesture of uh, goodwill and a, and a birthday gift for ESLA and SLT Day, our CODEC colleagues have prepared a video highlighting the importance of collaboration between speech language therapists and occupational therapists. Uh, a, a thankful, a heartfelt thankful to their president, Anna Soderstrom, and the colleagues from the board for reaching out to us and for taking the time to make the video. Um, so everyone sit back and enjoy the video. March 6th is the European Speech and Language Therapy Day. Occupational therapists across Europe collaborate closely with speech and language therapists with clients of all age. In this video, three of my colleagues from Ireland, Finland and Malta will describe their collaboration with SLTs. On behalf of Coltec, I would like to wish all speech and language therapists a great day and thank you for the collaboration. My name is Marie and I'm a senior occupational therapist working in acute stroke in Galway University Hospitals, Ireland. I'm extremely lucky to work with a fantastic team of speech and language therapists who provide assessment and treatment to patients with swallowing and communication difficulties following stroke. I particularly enjoy collaborating on cases where there are tricky cognitive and language deficits and problem solving with my speech therapy colleagues on how best to meet the needs of each patient. We also work together on client-centred functional goals, which can range from self-feeding, reading and writing, through th to use of assistive technology. My job is easier and more enjoyable because of the wonderful collaborative relationships we have established. Olen toimintaterapeutti Marika Hurme ja työskentelen yksityisellä palveluntuottajalla Toikun Oyssä. Asiakaskuntani koostuu autismikirjon lapsista ja nuorista. Teen hyvin tiivistä yhteistyötä kuntouttavien puheterapeuttien kanssa. Määrittelemme jo varhaisessa vaiheessa samansuuntaiset arkeen vaikuttavat tavoitteet. Yhteisterapiat toteutuvat tarpeen sekä tavoitteiden mukaisesti. 
Yhdessä muokkaamme sekä ohjaamme keinoja lapsen lähi-ihmisille, jotta lapsi pystyisi mahdollisimman paljon itse vaikuttamaan omaan arkeensa. Yksittäiset toiminnot, joita terapiassa tehdään, ollaan mietitty niin, että samalla toiminnolla pystytään tukemaan sekä puheterapian että toimintaterapian tavoitteita ja kuormitus lapsen arjessa olisi mahdollisimman vähäinen. Hello, my name is Sharon Borch Kempri and I am an occupational therapist working with Access to Communication and Technology Unit, one of the services offered by Agencia Support in Malta. ACTU is the National Assistive Technology Center. Many of the clients referred to us have complex communication needs. I work closely with the speech and language therapists on the team contributing to AAC assessments. I am also involved in the implementation of these solutions in our clients' environments. This collaboration helps us to utilize our expertise to problem solve solutions and strategies. Collaboration in this way enables us to reach goals efficiently. I personally have learned a lot from this collaboration and this I take this opportunity to thank my speech and language therapist colleagues for their daily inspiration and wish you all a good speech and language therapy day. Thank you. It was inspiring. Before uh, we finish our day, please let me um, remind you that uh, you can you can still register for our congress. Please visit the congress website and uh, see all the information. You can see our keynote speakers and as mentioned earlier, the early bird registration is extended until March 6. So please go ahead. We are looking forward to seeing everyone um, in, in Salzburg. Allow me to thank our task, my task force members, Plazenka, Daniela, Rafaela, and Raluca for taking all this um, workload on the IT uh, responsibilities today. Thank you, everybody. And on behalf of ESLA and the SLT Day Task Force, I would like to thank everybody for attending, wishing everybody a happy uh, speech and language therapy. I hope you have uh, many celebrations in your countries and hope I'm closing with um, the big hope that our next meeting will be under better circumstances, both political, but also uh, in, the, in the health department. So have a nice day, everybody. Thank you for attending. Happy European Day. Good morning. Bye.